Here I have a selective amplifier that can also be used as an oscillator. It has a filter with 20 parallel crystals here. They are selected from 200 crystals of manufacturers Abracon and NDK, which have turned out to be the best one. About 1 in 10 is useful of these crystals. And you can see about that in a previous video in this NERDS series. And then after the crystals there is an amplifier and with a, is it called bootstrap circuitry? And then a power amplifier with many parallel JFETs that can deliver about two and a half watts. The whole thing takes uh, 700 milliamps at 25 volts and it gets fairly hot. I have to put coolers on it later on to get down the noise, the thermal noise from it. Here I'm running the amplifier in the interferometer. There are two problems. One is mechanical stability. If I tap on the table like this, you can see I get very strong sidebands some uh, 20 decibels or so at frequencies uh, around well 10 to 50 hertz or so and also at higher frequencies there are mechanical vibrations inside here if I knock on the, knock on the box of course it's much stronger so I need some uh, uh, isolation for vibrations. Here is several kilograms of steel. This, I don't know what you call it, the holder. And this is a solid block of steel. And these are steel plates. And beneath there is foam plastic to make it possible to vibrate this. But now uh, here is what things look like at the moment and I knock on the table and that was a bit too much but as compared to what I had previously this is much better and then there is another problem if I talk very loudly I think there will be some vibration Aha! Uh -huh. No, no longer. I had that before, but that was in an earlier prototype for this. Uh, you can see variations with time. That is another problem. That is the stability of the interferometer. Uh, Here is the oscilloscope showing the uh, balancing of the interferometer. And I will turn the knobs for minimum now. and they do interact to some extent. Now I am not turning the knobs anymore. This is just the stability. So the frequency of the filter or the frequency of the oscillator that I am amplifying, that is the Wenzel low, ultra low noise oscillator. And you can see it doesn't stay at zero and uh, if I wave my hands near the unit like this not much happened uh, I can blow on it 
and humidity and temperature of my breath immediately destroys the balancing here. So this is a problem with interferometric measurements on very sharp filters. Here is the frequency response. The input impedance here is about 50 ohms and the gain is about 20 decibels. Uh, I can look at the marker functions. Look for the bandwidth. The Q is 111,000, so it's a fairly narrow filter. And uh, marker 2, that's on the peak automatically. So if I look at measure 1 and marker and the marker 2, I find 50.2 ohms. So that's nice. And here is the output impedance, 47 and a half ohm. Uh, if I sweep over a wider frequency range, frequency and span 0.1 megahertz, that doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, 1 megahertz, well, then we can see some small difference. The phase is no longer correct, but you can see that the output is wideband 50 ohms. I have placed this bunch of papers on top of the uh, selective amplifier uh, to minimize air circulation and that is in order to have a better short-term uh, thermal stability. And indeed it helps a little so I tuned the, the knobs. Oh. And then the other one. And it is now significantly more stable. Now it's stable long enough for me to measure sideband noise with good accuracy. And obviously there is some thermal drift, but much less. So I go to the computer screen, and here was some interference. I don't know why. There are these bursts of noise occasionally. But here is the noise floor. And it's the yellow, uh, which is the average of the two channels. And both are very similar. 147.6 is the average. This is the properly computed average. And then uh, there is no correlation advantage. I don't see any difference between uh, the white and the yellow traces. Not until I go to a much wider frequency separation. So uh, I have minus 147.6 here and the separation is 25 Hertz. Oh, I have magnification. That's Here we are. Uh, that's the main spectrum, and here is the uh, filter centered at 25 hertz above the strong signal. Here is the schematic diagram of the crystal filter and the 
first amplifier. Uh, the input signal is split into two halves, 100 ohms resistor here, and then with this capacitor uh, it's tuned to present 50 ohms at this point, which means that half the power goes down here and half the power goes into the crystals. There are 20 of them, rated 1 milliwatt each, means 20 milliwatts, so maximum power is 40 milliwatts plus 16 dBm. Uh, the voltage across the crystals is divided with two capacitors to not represent too much to the transistors. Uh, the transistors are 6J310 in parallel. Each one has a separate uh, source resistor to make sure the current is the same in all of them and that resistor is decoupled. Uh, from the source uh, there is a DC blocking capacitor and then a transformer to provide 180 degrees phase shifted at this point. Then there is a serious resonator with a resistor to ground and with this trimmer I can tune the phase here to be exactly the right uh, then to with this capacitor uh, feed uh, the antiphase signal here to completely uh, neutralize the uh, capacitive load from the FET and as a consequence the impedance I see at this point is 9 ohms resistive also on the resonance Without this feedback arrangement, the impedance grows quite a bit on the resonance peak. Then the output voltage uh, here, that's what goes to the power amplifier, uh, and there is a DC bias on it also. Uh, the output signal is amplified uh, with six transistors MPSH10, each one with 10 ohms in the emitter. And this is an emitter follower, all of them in parallel, that provides a signal on the drain of these transistors. This means that the source as well as the drain follows the gate, and that minimizes the capacitive load from the transistor. There is some voltage division, because there is 10 ohms here, 6 in parallel, but still there is a small resistance, and then there is a resistive load here. So the voltage is not the full, it's about 80% of the gate voltage. Uh, there are, this uh, transistor has a very high transition frequency, it easily goes into oscillations. So there are uh, here some snubbers to stop oscillations in the typically 1.2 gigahertz or 800 megahertz or so forth range. Uh, the source, sorry, the emitter has an inductor here to allow the voltage to go well below uh, zero, and it's the same for the input junction FETs. Uh, between the junction FETs and this source, this emitter follower, there is an RC link, 22 ohms and 27 PF, and that is in series with 47 ohms, but in all there is a time delay because of capacitor and also these capacitors and therefore uh, this inductance here provides a phase shift in the opposite direction to make the phase of the signal on the drain uh, the same as the phase on the source. Uh, and 
I don't know what more to say about this, but here is the diagram again. This is the power amplifier. The input signal with a source impedance of 9 ohms and with a DC voltage on it goes to a coil with about 50% for the tap, is halfway. Uh, and the coil is tuned with about 600 PF variable. And then uh, there is 28 transistors, J310, with these 600 PF distributed as 100 PF capacitors at several points in order to make the inductance to ground small from all of the FETs because this thing is easily an oscillator at various frequencies. Then uh, the drain and the source go in opposite directions into a transformer. Uh, two turns on each one. Uh, the source, there is just a decoupler and a resistor to set the current. On the drain, uh, there is 0.3 microhenry wound on a 50 ohm resistor and then decoupled and with a 100 PF capacitor across here. That was to uh, eliminate oscillations. And then 0.1 microfarad to decouple for RF. 10,000 microfarads to decouple uh, low frequencies. And it's fed from 24 volts and that is also going to the input amplifier. Uh, the current that goes out here uh, from the other side of this winding, which is eight turns, with two turns on the transistor windings, so there is four times more voltage, four times less current. That current is coupled to the input coil. Uh, this provides a feedback and that makes the output impedance resistive part 50 ohms. By tweaking the position of this link, I can set the resistive part of the output impedance. And this, then this capacitor compensates for the inductance of this thing and the leak inductance of the winding. So there is 50 ohms resistive on the output wideband, as you have seen on the network analyzer image. So this is again what it looks like. I have run the unit as an amplifier, amplifying the signal from the ultra low noise oscillator that I have from Wenzel. And I showed just one of the points just before going into the details of the schematics. Here is the sideband noise at 25 Hertz uh, at different power levels. Maximum power 16 dBm here and all the way down to minus 22 dBm. And we can clearly see that the sideband noise has an optimum somewhere around here. That happens to be about plus 10 dBm. And that is what I observe uh, when running this as an amplifier in the interferometer. Here is the interferometer. I have modified it a little since previous measurements because the device under test is selective means I have uh, put the injection of the uh, reference signal for calibration purposes on the other side of the device under test. But I can still set the injected signal to a certain level with respect to the signal that is passing through here. Uh, so I can measure the ratio of the carrier from the uh, 
main signal uh, and the signal from the injected the reference oscillator. And I use the passives for that measurement. Uh, and the input is from this Wenzel 5010431F, which is a good oscillator. Uh, so the signal is uh, set the amplitude and the low pass filter and an hybrid splitting it into the signal going into the device under test and the other signal which is set to the same phase and amplitude by these uh, phase adjusting in steps with cable lengths and then a fine tuning on the phase and then amplitude, an analog fine tuning and a stepped attenuator. And since the device under test gives a lot of gain, there is an attenuator to set the gain through here close to zero. Uh, and then there's this hybrid these two signals cancel in the difference output, so there I get only the noise added by the device under test, and possibly noise due to various uh, problems in these uh, uh, adjustment things, but they are far below the noise from the device under test, so that is really what I see here. Uh, the different signal goes through here and into a an hybrid that splits it into two equal halves that go into two different receivers and that enables me to use the correlation spectra between these two uh, in order to see noise below the noise of the receivers themselves. These receivers are direct conversion, they are impaired by phase noise on the oscillators they are using, but because of this uh, roosting two of them with the correlation spectra, that can be eliminated. And then there is some signal picked up here. Uh, this is a minus 9 dB coupler, so it doesn't attenuate much, the main signal. But this signal goes to a low pass filter, an amplifier, bandpass, and this is to remove overtones that otherwise would saturate the system. And then a stepped attenuator by which I can set the sensitivity much lower because when there is a serious misadjustment, the oscilloscope will saturate, so I see nothing on it. So I can turn down the gain, so I can see on the oscilloscope, and then adjust phase and amplitude. And then there is one more amplifier, and another channel on the oscilloscope, where I can do see the fine adjustment. And normally I set this stepped attenuator to zero, to not attenuate anything. Uh, well, I think that's about enough on the interferometer. Here is what the receivers look like. This is one channel, a local oscillator, uh, plus 27 dBm, uh, and a minus 20 dB coupler, uh, followed by a 20 dB attenuator, taking out a signal for the PLL. Uh, and then in one channel there is an input for the PLL system to keep the local oscillators for the two received channels in phase. The local oscillator signal that goes through here is split with a hybrid uh, 90 degrees and going to two 23 dBm mixers, level 23 mixers from mini circuits. Uh, the RF signal comes in here, is amplified with a very low noise amplifier 
attenuated to set the impedance here because this is a noiseless feedback amplifier that reflects the impedance from here to the input. It's followed by a low noise high gain amplifier PSA 4543 and then there is a 90 degree hybrid that splits the signal into two halves going to the two mixers. Each mixer is followed by an audio filter and an amplifier. And then there is I and Q going to the sound card, the four channel sound card, uh, the UADC4 that I'm using in this set of measurements. This is the PLL system. Uh, the signals from the two local oscillators are amplified by these amplifiers which provide a good isolation for backwards signals because it's very important to prevent the two local oscillators to see each other because that will provide locking at uh, fairly high frequencies and that will destroy the independence between them. Uh, they have to be independent down to very low frequencies. Uh, the uh, two oscillators are connected with a level 7 mixer from a mini circus. And then there is an amplifier. This amplifier can uh, set different time constants with an RC link uh, up to I don't remember, but you can see in previous videos uh, it's a matter of minutes when it's set to the slowest. Then there is an oscilloscope to monitor uh, the signal coming out from the amplifier, but before the very long time constant. And then the low pass filtered uh, RC link filter goes to the local oscillator to keep the frequency locked to the frequency of the other oscillator. I have now disconnected the interferometer by running a cable from the stepped attenuator uh, all the way to the receiver here and also cut at this point as well as at this point. Well, focus on this camera, I don't understand how it works, but it takes some time and then it wakes up. Anyway, uh, I just feed the Wenzel oscillator into the two-channel receiver. I have also modified the two channels of the receiver by removing the amplifiers, amplifier, attenuator, amplifier, and running the signal directly into this hybrid. That sets the gain to a suitable level, very close to saturation of the, of the receivers. The signal level is 1 dB from saturation in the channel where the gain is maximum. And this is what I see on the Linrod screen. And on the S meter, when I'm on the carrier, I have calibrated to show zero. And then I look uh, 25 hertz away. That's here. Now it has been running for a long time, 9,100 averages. Uh, the correlation advantage is 15 and a half dB and the channel levels on the average is minus 133 and a half dBc per hertz. And the channels are very different, as you can see from the red and the blue trace here, or from the spectrum. The green trace, channel 1, has about 10 dB more noise at close range, the difference is smaller at a wider separation. My oscillators are not e e equal. 
there is a spur in channel 2 as you can see here at 37 hertz or so and uh, it is a little bit asymmetric the noise here is a little higher than the noise here and I guess that is because there is some correlation uh, between phase noise and uh, amplitude noise what I'm measuring here is the sum of both well the net result is the sum of this and that I have now inserted the selective amplifier uh, with an appropriate attenuator after it to make the gain zero and I have uh, set the level uh, to be the same as before uh, relatively close there is 1.3 dB margin to saturation and the level I see differs by 0.1 dB from before uh, the spectrum the waterfall this was with the Wenzel and this is with the Wenzel followed by the selective amplifier and the same from here to here and I move the frequency in order to verify the uh, level here and I can recalibrate for this 0.15 dB difference like this the selective amplifier has now been running with plus 12 dBm input power collecting uh, 22,000 averages the correlation advantage is 12 dB and if I evaluate the noise I find minus 133.8 now I'm feeding plus 6 dBm into the a selective amplifier and I've collected many enough averages and the correlation advantage is now 10.8 dB and the noise is at minus 133.9 I'm now rounding at plus 16 dBm the maximum power and I note some odd phenomenon here this is likely uh, uh, some oscillation in the crystal of the filter uh, I note that the noise floor here is much higher than before while at 25 Hertz the difference is not so big I will wait a little bit more this sideband oscillation varies with time as you can see here uh, the correlation advantage stops at about 10.3 dB and the noise floor is unchanged essentially minus 133.9 I'm plotting the measurements uh, directly on the uh, uh, selective filter uh, in the same diagram uh, this line is the Wenzel uh, and I plot that as independent of the power level because it the sideband noise will not change when I add attenuators to reduce it or maybe an amplifier to amplify it a little as I did here I have a very good uh, amplifier with the bu with a MOSFET that doesn't add noise at 25 Hertz not at these levels anyway uh, the point I get here is about 3 dB above the Wenzel which means that the noise added by the selective filter is similar to the noise present in the Wenzel so the measurement becomes fairly uncertain although it's pretty clear that it goes up here 
and it goes up here even if it's only 1 dB so there could be some accuracy problems I will make a few more measurements at other power levels to see if I can get uh, some more uh, interesting results from this the power is now plus 8 dBm correlation advantage 12.8 and the noise average is minus 134 note that the noise here the green track is much lower than it was at uh, 16 dBm so it seems to be more interesting to study sideband noise at a greater offset. I have made some more measurements and obtained some more data points. And it looks like here I made a mistake. Maybe there was a noise burst of some kind. Uh, anyway. Uh, it seems that I have a curve like this and I will do some changes to allow measurement at lower power levels and also at wider frequency separations I have made four notch filters like this using some RM6 cores with a winding on them that I had from an old project uh, the inductance is about 60 millihenries and they tune with 1 microfarad to 700 hertz. Uh, so there is a serious link to provide 50 ohms for the input and for the output. For the serious resonators here and here I need a much lower impedance, means a big capacitor and a much smaller winding. Now I don't have big capacitors, but by putting a link here with 50 turns, I get the appropriate uh, impedance versus frequency here. And here are these four uh, notches, and they are all tuned properly. And the attenuation is about 30 decibels on 700 hertz. And that's the frequency where I have the carrier uh, when mixing down the WEN cell with the, these oscillators. That are the oscillators of my receiver. I have moved the jumpers in the UADC4 from the position here, which is minimum gain, to the position here which is maximum gain this way the gain here is now 15 decibels higher and I can do that because the carrier is attenuated by 30 dB so there will be no saturation I have also added a, a 3 dB attenuator on the input of the receivers the two channels that is to make the compression smaller that I see in these mixers. I'm going to measure the sideband noise at several frequency separations. So I set a fixed level on this signal generator, the pilot tone, and then I have calibrated lean rod to show zero on the yellow line here, the average of the two channels. And then I put it in my table and then change the frequencies downwards. I'm going towards the notch and now at 125 Hertz the attenuation is nearly 4 dB. Uh, it's a little different between the channels 6.7 here and 6.37 here. Uh, but I am taking this value, which is the proper uh, combination of the powers that will correspond to the white track, which is the F reference for the correlation measurement later on. I have set the carrier to plus 16 dBm 
going into my selective amplifier and I'm monitoring that with the percives and I have set the calibration of the percives to show zero for plus 16 dBm. Uh, then I will make this oscillator at 2 kHz above approximately. It comes here and I will make it show minus 60. So the average of these two, the upper two ones, which are independent of the bandwidth, uh, they show now 60. My, minus 60 with reference to the carrier. I have switched off the carrier and as you can see there is some very small compression here. Uh, so now it shows minus 59.6. So there is 0.4 or 5 dB uh, compression in one of the channels that has a little too low oscillator level. But I don't worry about these very minor details. The noise level is very high at 2 kHz separation, minus 149 dBc per hertz. But when looking at the output on the oscilloscope, I see that there is saturation. So I reduce the, um, the source resistor here by connecting one more 22 ohm resistor in parallel. And that changes. So there's, well, I have to hold it better. Like that. And then look here at the S meter graph. Uh, this is much better. Uh, the current is increasing from 70 milliamps to 23 milliamps per transistor. So I will add this resistor to get some more power. Now the waveform is almost okay. There is a little wiggle here. Uh, it is 37 volts peak to peak. That's 3.4 watts into 50 ohms. I added a little more attenuation after the selective amplifier and I repeat the calibration because everything has changed now. So the carrier is now showing zero here and the reference, the pilot tone here. comes at minus 60.09 so I make it one tenth of a dB stronger like that and then I close this window and look uh, what I see uh, here is the And it is not very much changed the calibration, but I redo it. So now it's calibrated again and I switch off the signal generator to look where is the noise floor. And it's much better than before. Minus 157.7. But I will check whether there is a correlation advantage here. So I press Alt Z like that. And I have to wait for a while. As it turns out, the noise floor is not stable. It's going up slowly. And I can of course see that here also. I had here minus 156. And now it is 
minus 154. That's two decibels. And that's a marked difference on the waterfall. So the unit is getting too hot and uh, I have to do something about that. A fan here and the noise is immediately going down. Now the box is significantly cooler. It was above 100 degrees centigrade originally. Now it's 58. 55. But the noise has increased very much. So there is an optimum temperature. Uh, I cannot run this unit as, as high power like this. I have to reduce the input signal a little bit. This was a 3 dB reduction of the input signal and it made uh, from 130 to 150, 20 decibels on the noise. So something happens, maybe there is a VHF oscillation starting or something. The nonlinear increase of the sideband noise starts at plus 13 dBm. So now I am putting plus 12 dBm into the selective amplifier and I have made a calibration to minus 60 and I did the previous calibration part earlier. And here is now the noise floor, minus 161.7. And I can see from the yellow trace there is a significant correlation advantage. So I press Alt Z again. And I have to wait for the correlation evaluation to be finished. Well, something is unstable. Here the noise was low, I've been away for a while, the noise has been higher. Now it went down again, and of course we can see that here. And I don't know what this means. It's a big difference, uh, because when the noise was low I had a significant correlation advantage, but now there is not. Uh, and there is a 5 dB difference here, so it's about 15 dB increase of the noise. Wideband. The upper trace is the drain voltage and the lower trace is the source voltage of the output uh, bunch of transistors. I have a strong magnet here and I put it close to this output transformer. You can see how it moves. And look here, this is with the magnet and this is without. So it seems that the inductance goes down a little bit when the uh, ferrite is subjected to a strong magnetic field. But this is at uh, plus 12 dBm. I increase the power without the magnet. And this doesn't look nice anymore, so I put back the magnet, and this looks much better. So, uh, something is going on here that I think I have to look deeper into. So, this is... Uh, Now plus 16 dBm and with the magnet and I put that extra source resistor in place again. I did remove it. This is with the source resistor. It doesn't look as nice as without it. But if I remove that magnet it looks like this. And I put this source resistor back to increase the current. And it doesn't look much better. Although the output did look a little bit better. So uh, something is not so good with this output transformer. 
maybe it doesn't have enough iron. I have replaced that transformer. This one is better. It has a stronger coupling between primary and secondary because I have filled this uh, ferrite with copper and also paste some copper tape on the outside and that is in order to force the magnetic flux into the ferrite. And this is also heavier, it's more ferrite. This did not make much of a difference. Uh, what did make a difference is changing the operating voltage. It is fairly critical. At a too low voltage uh, it starts to create noise because the drain voltage and the source voltage they come to the same level more or less and then the transistor becomes noisy and with a too high voltage for unknown reasons it also starts to create noise. Anyway uh, I have turned it down from 25 to 22 volts which is a sweet point for it and then I have set the level to uh, uh, 12 plus 4, that is 16 dBm. It is the Wenzel oscillator here, plus 6 dB gain, minus 2 dB. The system is properly calibrated and it has been running for quite some time. So it has collected 17,000 averages, sorry, 27 27,000 averages, 17.19, uh, that is the number of decibels that the noise floor theoretically uh, has been reduced, but the noise floor I see is 10 dB. So uh, I have collected many enough averages with some margin. I want the white and the blue to differ by 6 dB. Uh, to think that I have a fairly accurate reading. Anyway, uh, the noise floor here is minus 161.2 and the correlation advantage is 10.1 and that is at 2 kilohertz. Now I have the correlated spectra so I can just move to another frequency so that will be 1 kilohertz and I can see here that uh, the noise is a little bit higher and I can see that the correlation advantage is a little bit smaller. And, uh, so I will fill these numbers into the uh, paper I'm creating here. At the close range here, this is 30 Hz, uh, I have to set the narrower bandwidth. It's a little bit more than 1 Hz. And you can see the noise is going up here. That's the oscillator noise from my receiver. But then it goes down here because that's the notch uh, falling faster than the noise is rising. So I need a narrow bandwidth. Uh, I have now reduced uh, the power to 12 dBm and I can see that the noise floor is significantly lower. You can see the correlation is 13.3 here and uh, it is 6 dB above the theoretical limit so I can start to do the evaluation now. Uh, I have done all the data points for 16 dBm power into the selective filter. I will plot them, but I will also evaluate at 12 dBm before that. Here is what I have seen now. Uh, the blue points are 16 dBm, the red ones are 12 dBm. So it looks reasonably well. But here something goes wrong. Uh, the sideband noise does not change much with the power level. Uh, well, that could be perfectly okay. But previously I have had values down here. 
remember this graph minus 147 or so so something happens close to the notch frequency I have disconnected the selective amplifier and connected the Wenzel oscillator directly to the receiver at plus 12 dBm and then I get the green points you see here and they fall very close to the points I had before uh, when I measured the Wenzel fairly long ago it's the curve here at that time I was measuring also at very close separations but now when I do it through the notch filter at about 100 Hertz something happens there is a steep slope must be noise from the notch filter uh, so <coughs> uh, I cannot use this notch filter for frequencies below something like maybe 500 Hertz I extrapolate this one downwards uh, but above 500 Hertz or so uh, I think I can get good accuracy uh, from this method and I will do some separate studies I have then three frequency bands uh, below 100 Hertz then I can do it fairly well uh, I think with the receiver without the notch and above 500 Hertz I can do it up to 48 kilohertz with the notch filter and above 45 kilohertz I have a notch at 10 megahertz that I can use